Alright, let's get this party started. Row 30, February 4th. Um, we're going to have lots of fun today. Yeah. We wrote the agenda a little bit. Uh, make a little, a little. <clears throat> we will make a slight adjustment to what's listed in the syllabus. Uh, the syllabus says today, uh, data management, human database, Excel, Access, no online GIS, and then for last week we need to catch up on the geocoding part. And we review a little bit of digitizing. Um, because that is a tool everyone needs to know, like, in your sleep. Yeah? Worst case, you have happy dreams about it, not nightmares. So, um, I want to push the uh, online part a little bit, because next week's schedule will say something about geoprocessing, spatial workshop, buffers, and all. So, proximity uh, measures, like ring circles, uh, all, that, all, all that stuff. Um, I want to open that up. Let's see how we get there here at the end. Um, and the reason for that is I don't want to mess up platforms. Yeah? Platforms as in for desktop and online. There's lots of overlap and com combination of it creates great synergies. Um, but I'm thinking it will be a little bit easier for you to get through a major step in the desktop world and say, hey, you're standing on two feet solid on the ground, let's open up the online part. So it's like just shifting an hour here and there from the sessions. Reading lists, exercise lists, um, is the same thing. Uh, if you look at the syllabus, some people might have not seen that yet. So we had assignment one due last Saturday. Assignment two, two was due today. Next week, the 11th, no assignment to do. Like no real physical file to submit with doing spatial work. However, what we're going to use for the next two weeks is closing the basics on the desktop and evolve into the advanced level. And that is at the end of the class a student's project. And we haven't been talking about that. Yeah? So instead of sitting in, in front of the computer screen and digitizing or mapping out data, I want you to spend a little bit of time the next few days uh, out and thinking about your final project. Uh, I'll give you the final project description after class slash later tonight um, because I want to change it a little bit and then need to write this in a different language. Um, <clears throat> so the thing that will be due next week is like a half page. Hey, this is what I'm thinking about. This is going to be my idea. Yeah? It's like, hey, I want to map out all sea turtle hospitals from Boca Raton to Miami Beach. Yeah? Because of. So you have a topic, a theme, and a justification. If Jason, let's say, wants to go with all the fast food restaurants or the Dunkin' Donuts, yeah? and he wants to do coffee shops, well, then he says, okay, fine, I want to do something about coffee shops. I honestly. Yes, this is a real estate development class. If you want to do a topic that is using all the methodology and the tools we teach in this class, but it's a little bit off topic as a theme, so it's not an economic or a real estate topic, it's fine with me. That's the reason why I brought up the sea turtle example. Huh? Um, demographics, business ideas, Location-driven decision-making is the best topic. Since we're in a real estate development program, maybe looking at the side, running down some market analysis, some uh, proximity measures, some competitive uh, analytics, something like that. Like, hey, if I want to open a coffee shop, where are all the other coffee shops so far? Where's my competition? Yeah? And there are different ways to do that. We had last year we had a student who went above, uh, I'll say, above and beyond, and he actually pulled all the Miami Dade building permits, ran them through a very complicated server selection process, yeah, like really really crazy stuff. And like I'm like, okay, I'm looking at this, and I was like, 
this guy spent way too much time to advance the topic, but in a good thing. And then he ran all these uh, analytics, so way beyond. But he, what he did is basically saying, I need to find a way how to predict what neighborhood will come next for my developments. Uh, and then he did this in a perfect way. Uh, um, we had classic examples for, hey, let's pick a hotel. Let's make some rehab uh, uh, out of that. What I want you to understand with this little thinking exercise a good GIS project needs to be thought through. You need to put out somewhat like we call a roadmap, like a theme, an idea, somewhat where do I get my data from, how can I make this, am I going to digitize this or geocode, this is what we're going to do today. Yeah. I have an address list of 200 restaurants in the area, so I put them on the map yeah, versus I click 200 times. Yeah. and. Understanding that, yes, we have nine students, we are going to deal with different animals, everyone has their own personal flavor uh, for the topics, but it's not a shocker that, you, that I, my professor will tell me on a Friday evening, hey, by tomorrow morning you have to deliver this project. It's a thinking process, we can work this out. The reason why I need to have this kind of little project, road, project roadmap from you is that you and I do not have nasty surprises as in final session hey this is my project and everyone's like no that's not even close to something yeah, so this is me don't want you to walk on thin ice solid robust thinking and no nasty surprises with bad grades because you didn't think this through and the roadmap gives me the possibility to give you the tremendous feedback I would have, be happy to give. You know? It's like every time when someone to inspire drops me an email, I try to be short but really in depth. You know? If you send me 50,000 emails a day, it's going to be one minus. You know? But my passion with the geospatial stuff is GIS is about people and fun. So with the final project, you can pick whatever topic you want in that kind of framework for this class. Yeah? But we need to communicate that you're on the right track for this. Yeah? You don't have to invent the space, the space station for it. But maybe deal with a parking lot. Alright? A little bit weak, but most important part is you guys got this. Yeah? So there are a few that struggle. You gotta communicate. I cannot help you guys when you come in two or three weeks later and say, yeah, I couldn't make this. No? But it's a learning process. Imagine today you are what? Fourth session. Four weeks ago, you opened that software probably the very first time with the instruction, let's add data. No? Let that settle in. Four weeks ago, baby steps. You learned how to walk. Today we're going to have our first 5K run. Yeah? So that's kind of the idea what I have in mind for, for today. Um, the fundamental thought on today, that's the reason why I shifted around a little bit. This is review. This we noted. This is a fun moment. Adding in something very important to you guys. This we noted. I haven't done it yet. Remember, we did take a look at the data, the data, the data tables, CSV and DBF. We gotta put them into action. The geocoding part is going to absorb most of today. Ideally, not. But uh, geocoding is always a little bit tricky. Yeah? It's my favorite thing to do. Um, particularly if you can only get 95% and try to treat the 5% into real hits. Our example should go over 100% because the most frustrating part in GIS uh, class is you're going to geocode something and it's not working and not working and not working. It was like, man, I had a student last class, she was really upset with me because I didn't tell her that we're going to do this exercise and at the end of the exercise we will realize that we failed. But it's like, man, what kind of teaching is that? 
So with geocoding, you always, when I click to OK to geocode, I always expect the system to fail or return not to complete perfect hits. I'm not setting up my world for failure. Good parenting, don't set up the kid for failure. Yeah? Good teaching, don't set up the student for failure. My GIS for geocoding, I expect it to do something I have to validate and take a look later. Clean up and validation. Very fine validating. Yeah? It's not good enough just to click geocode, get a few hundred points on the map, and say, yeah, I'm done with it. You gotta go back and examine the work. Huh? And then again, geodatabases at the end. This is a different animal in terms of data management. So I wanna do all this, and then we go to more the advanced automated stuff. Huh? There's some repetition in there, but going, doing this step, it makes a really separate click. I would keep things in different boxes, and then sometimes the separation needs to be in place. All right, any questions about that battle plan? Danny, you had raised your hand. What was that about? Uh, oh, it was just a stretch. Okay. Maybe. Good. Um, oh, safe. I want to just repeat this. Um, because this is a very tiny tool with a right click on your data table, in your, your table, in the attribute table in your uh, system. With the field calculator, you can add and multiply, etc. You can use complex functions. You can combine text fields together and create names or addresses. Yeah? Like the concatenate function in Excel, it does the same thing. If you have Excel, say E1 plus E2, or D, D1 plus E1, as an example, yeah, it will do that here as well. Multiply A, the cell A1 and B1, it will do that for you. You can calculate in that line easily. Yeah, has numeric and text functions. We have seen this before, this is the example from last week. If I have all my age distribution in the census data, here, age under five, age five to 17, yeah? why do I know that this is a numeric field? What's the easy going trick? It's right, 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 it's right aligned, exactly. Normally, if you don't mess around with the alignment, it's on the right side. Yeah? So what this calculation does here is you edit a field called H017, numeric. Yeah? And then you say basically, this is like an Excel. You say that cell here, that 122 is computed out of the H under five and the H under five, uh, between five and 17. Yeah? Like you would do a calculation in Excel for each, but it goes by row. You don't say A1 or B12. You just say, hey, in the corresponding element, that cell plus that cell equals this. Yeah? Super simple, super easy to do. We're playing around with this a little bit. Um, there's a way to do this with one item alone. There's a way to do this with the whole table, which is typically the case. This is doing the whole table. Yeah? But you have seen this part here, show all and show selected. We haven't been messing around with selections yet. The book showed you a few examples, but in the class we haven't done real selections. Yeah? So this is part of the field calculator exercises later at the end today where you're going to make up some examples and just going this way, this way, all of the above. Yeah? Like literally, we make up the examples. All right. The reason why I repeat the slide and the screenshot is it's so tiny, but it's so powerful. 
Yeah. Again, text fields here. We have this example. So you can combine addresses. Yeah. So street number with the street name combined into the address with the street number and the space. And the catch was here how to add that space. Yeah. is a container. You know, and the misleading terms of, for the geodatabase because if you, let's say, work in a larger company, they might have an enterprise geodatabase. Uh, they have a server somewhere or some cloud-style setup. In our context, the geodatabase, we symbolize it as a can or container. Yeah? And it ends with that .gdb for geodatabase. Uh -huh. And the word .gdb is an example from the textbook. So we play with shapefiles. We know how to create a shapefile. Uh -huh. We learned how to add geog uh, geographic coordinate systems to it, projections. Uh -huh. So, and about, uh, when was that? 2000. 2007. Um, as we basically started saying, okay, we need to come up with something different. So they used, back, back in the old days, they used the Microsoft Access format, the MDB database, and wrote everything inside the MDB file. And then they came up in 2007, I think it was, with their own type of system, which is that kind of CAN symbol, um, because now it has huge terabyte, you know, it's like, multiple laptops combined, or uh, storage capacity. It has all the fun features from the cloud slash enterprise solutions limited on a local machine, which is massive. It also, also manages your data for you. So if I want to calculate how large is my building footprint, how many square foot, or how many square meters, if I save this as now as a feature class, not anymore as a shape file, but we refer to both of them as a layer. In your map, it's a layer. It's a feature class in your tree database or a shape file on your computer. Yeah? It's I think we need to have this on the board. Layer. Yeah? So now we can have this as a SHP or later on as a feature class on FC. Yeah? We're going to touch base with one element that's also called a layer, which is the dot layer, yeah? or symbology layer. The dot layer is in the book. Already I've been exposed to that. Yeah? So, Look at the board. These three are all considered in your map a layer. Because you have different setups in the map. Yeah? And you drill down to a specific point. But there are three physical different representations where the data is coming from. Could be coming from from a shape file. It could be coming from from a feature class that is in your geo database, or it could come from a dot layer file as a symbology link. Yeah. That is basically pointing at the data by saying, "Hey, everything is pink or everything is purple." Right? There has no physical data in installed. Yeah. Very confusing. Take a breath. We're going through step by step of this. Yeah? Because what I can do is I can set up my awesome disposable income legend yeah? and 
save it as a dot layer file. So every time I'm putting numbers uh, like the disposable income together for the 2000 and 2010 census or 2015 survey, I can use the same color ramp because it will import its symbology, all the color schemes and all the interval cuts you make. Huh? Kirsten is like, oh my god, he's scaring me. This is just think about this. This is just a different bucket of paint you're putting into the map. Spray can, gallon bucket, just a sticker. By telling you which one you need. Spray paint or bucket. No? We're going to get there. Alright. So the cheer database is the big big thing, the big elephant of today. Yeah? It has its charms. So if I look at my tutorial data, you can look, or you see that there's a county.gdb. It appears like a folder in your friend file explorer. Yeah? And you open it, you see all these funny looking mm -hmm. files. A0000000001.gdb tlx. Please do not click on any of these files, copy, paste, or delete. All this universe here is Esri. Or for us, it's the Pandora's box. Within mm -hmm. Windows File Explorer, we are not going to touch this. If you by accident copy and paste something like an export map or PDF in here, it's hard to find for creating. Technically, I look at every student's cheer database on a physical file, just to try to figure out if you maybe sunk some data into that abyss. Now that's the dark, dark, dark black hole for you. Yeah? The beauty of it, in our catalog here, catalog, this is your friend, yeah? it shows up as a can, that folder shows up as a can, and it shows you exactly what's inside. Table is called census data and something that's called tracks, polygons. Uh, polygons. Yeah? So trust the can, don't deal with the file explorer. Arc catalog is your friend. Because the, these hundreds of files here are all combined into just one or two of those. Yeah? G database is doing this management for you makes your life easier. The biggest challenges you face is how to get the data in and out. Oh, and that's it. All right. So last week we had this example, KML. Yeah? Key old markup language, used from particular from Google. Yeah? Um, it comes back to the idea of, hey, if I'm looking for some data, I don't have to $10,000 to buy a data package from a vendor and only need four or five locations to figure out what is the approximate competition here. Yeah? Uh, as part of a class assignment or something like this, or uh, work for class, a different class, completely legit in my point of view. So basically you use Google and say, hey, or Yellow Pages and say, show me what you have. Give me 20 addresses of those companies in that area. Yeah? Um, so the, it actually, the KML is a somewhat a format everyone kind of agreed upon, and therefore we can use this. And there's a function we can actually import and export. And I have uh, like a gimmick tool to start off the active uh, hands on session today. Um, so I put that up on Blackboard. We can download this in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really cool because I. Well, I want to keep it simple. I also can take whatever I've done, it's in your digitizing work, and I can transform that into a KML or KMC, a different type of formats. Yeah? And can give that to someone and say, hey, this is the cool stuff I just did in class. Yeah? And send it via email, they double click it, and if they have Google Earth installed, it pew, pops up and flies to that uh, space. Yeah? Yes, please. Is, is the data that we're going to be using for, the, for our projects is most likely going to be KML or, or like full geo, geo database? All of the above. Okay. All of the above. Yeah. Um, preferred data management is in the geo database. Yeah. Keeps it compact. It's not 
over all your machine. So you basically say, hey, my destination is GeoDatabase and just this project folder in the, in the database. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, on the assignments, I think I only had one student who had one or two files outside of the project folder and we solved that problem. Uh, everyone was really straight on spot saying, hey, I saved this in here, uh, which is good. Helps to handle the data the right way. So yeah, in terms of the final project, um, Every, all of the above, uh, there might be some data I can help with and some data you just Google and say, hey, find it. Oh, yeah. um, so you could go, let's say, to the Chamber of Commerce and for another day and see if there's a registration for a specific type. I've been get yesterday, I was a guest judge. Um, there was a uh, like shark tank and there was an idea about um, barbershops. The comment was, hey, why don't you look at the registry for licensed barbers and find their addresses, yeah? So in theory, you could grab that and use it for the class. Huh? The KML or KMC file, very easy to handle, very nifty. It also enables you to share your GIS produced data with someone who doesn't have GIS on their machine. Because at the bare minimum, Google Maps is in the browser. Google Earth is free to download. Yeah? So you don't need to have an installed GIS machine if you just want to show something. There are different ways to show your GIS pixel results as well. Yeah? Don't forget, you can always export a map or a PDF. There's also a way to share a map online. Yeah? But let's say you have absolutely, you're really sure this your partner, your person of in, uh, in the business has no idea about all that stuff. You're the geek. They just need something to show on the Google Maps here, bam, quick, and then maybe hit the button to go for the destination, KML. Quick and dirty, yeah? that's the job. Um, what we're going to do is the XY data. Here's the example for that long. And we're going through that step where we find our table in the map, uh, sorry, the mapping project. We right click on it as most of the time all the goodies are hidden with right click. We're going to find a function called display xy data. Yeah. There's a slight change in the lingo. Um, the book now, I think, calls it add, add xy event. If you look here at the end, in the appendix A, it's a task index. And now they call it xy coordinates, chapter 4 slash 5. Yeah. And oh. What's on the display? Things if you don't highlight them, you can't find them. Just okay. I will find it for you. Got a new book. Um it's in there, but it might have changed. Yeah. Old school, we would say add, add xy event because there's one step in between. It just flashes the data on your screen, but it doesn't create a physical file. No? So if you say display, that's actually the better part, display xy data, it takes the xy from your table, here from this table. No? We map it. Remember we had this table in the assignment when I call it field map. You have a field name and a description. Well, this is what you do as well. You want to know what's your X coordinate. You need to match the name of the field that has that information. Let's map it. Yeah? You field map it. So you map them out and then you create like a set of hundreds of points. Yeah? But here, it says events at the end. So all this display XY data, set it up, do it, it says events. That means if you now close your arc map and come back a week later, technically they're gone. Because they're just display. You know? They're popping up. What we need to do is, this is the important part, explanation marks behind it. Yeah? We need to export the data. 
slash save our data. And the way we're going to do this is we actually right click again on the event data export data. Now there will be one or two more screens behind that. So if we say save the data or export the data, we need to go for data export. Then you do this virtual floating in the air, grab it and pop it on the hard disk. Yeah? And this is the reason why I show this slide again. This is very good. Yes. Sorry, I just want to make sure when we're starting with the computers, they're going to show us we're going to do this. Yeah. Okay. Because you're showing us here. The pattern is short lecture, buzzwords, screenshots, do the exercise. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> I got you. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I got you. So, but uh, that's, that's enough craziness. Let's go back to this later. But so what I want to do is I want to mix this up a little bit, so you guys actually get some chairs done in the first hour. Oh, uh, let's go to Blackboard in your Vintage GIS folder. Which is here is data for there's a tab, it's called German food. And bottom. German food.kml. Yeah, so I download this guy. I already have that. Okay. So what I did is to show you guys this. If you do maps Google, yeah, and you basically zoom in here in the area we call home, region, and you would say, hey, okay, German restaurant. This is just me showing you how I got this KML file. It pops up with a bunch of examples here. Yeah? That's pretty close. I can support that for lunch. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, the mind-blowing part is actually more to the airport. Make some exit. Let's make some marketing here. Um, if you go down to Miami Airport, this is so far in a short time I've been in Florida, the best schnitzel you can find. And I am not a schnitzel person. No? So, they have schnitzel mania on Monday nights, two for one price. So if you want to be nice and close to the airport, it's a good spot. Alright. Fun aside, or humor aside. So basically you get this random pop-up, you have no idea how Google will select them. There might be the case that actually old Heidelberg here, um, because it's the closest one, is shown as the first, but there might be also some algorithm with payments and all the other stuff. Yeah? You have the old Heidelberg as well, Laura? Uh, I have not the German food. Yeah, I know, it's so terrible. Oh, I love pierogies. Yeah, but they're not German. What are they? So, they're different. Pierogies are yeah. different. Uh, my pierogies are all kinds of uh, from Finland. So that's where I know them. Actually, I think they're Russian, Soviet, or something East European. Uh, that's a good restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fine. Yeah. Channel search for German restaurant. German professor, German restaurant. I would be Russian, I would have looked for Russian for it. Yeah? Found this. So then, logged in to my maps. And I'm going to do this here with a few places in my maps. Yeah? And I'll ask you to log in. Blah, 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 blah. And then, it's a different setup, so it's a different mapping interface. But you basically can create this. And I went through all these and said, hey, add them to a layer. Yeah. And I saved it, etc. So you can prepare your own theme and you can combine that. The search alone doesn't do it. Yeah. And that was on the other browser. If you do this, shared food, there's somewhere a point where right here. Okay. <clears throat> I open it up in the next uh, tab, and there is this part here I can say export to KML. 
So you have a Gmail account, you make your own my maps, you create whatever you want, kindergartens, German fast food restaurants, you save this map, now you can share it with friends, or you can say export to KML. Um, if you do that, it pops up, you can make changes here. Yeah? So I did this with that file, German food KML, I did this. So if I looked at it, so I tested it earlier this morning. So if I double click, if I double click this guy, I have Google Earth installed. It pops up, loads Google Earth, yeah? and it flies over, yeah? and it shows me the, uh, the locations of those German restaurants. Yeah? That's nice and nifty. Yeah? So how do I do this with my mapping project? Well, I open up an ArcMap. ArcMap. I can do the same exercise in ArcGIS, uh, in ArcCalibroc too, yeah, because I'm using the toolbox. Now let's actually let's do this in ArcCalibroc too. Let's do it in ArcCalibroc. So you can see those steps more in detail. Okay, everyone has downloaded the key ML file from Blackboard? Oh, I just had to set up an account. Came up with Gmail? Yeah. Oh. So I'm lost now. I have my your places. Go to Blackboard, download the file germanfood.kml. So all the Google Maps part was showing you how to generate a KML file from Google Maps. I didn't quite catch because uh, I was just sitting out by Chrome. Uh, all the process of going to that uh, German restaurant, your maps. You have a Google account, Gmail account. You basically open up Google Maps. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's an option called My Maps or My Places. Yeah? So you have your personalized, customized setup. And you create your own mapping project with Google Maps and based on searches. So you can add good, you can add different things. It's just not restaurants because you can add different features and then you just export it under your place. Go ahead and hit Maps. Yeah. All right, guys. This is not the important part. How we ended up with the KML file. That's one of the processes. The important part for this class is if I give you a KML file, how to get it into your GIS. Huh? I'm more than happy in the break to explain that how to data mine, data scrap the data, the web page. Yeah. All right. So in our catalog, everyone has the KML file downloaded from Blackboard. Jason, you're happy. All right. In our catalog, I'm going to click here on the Arc toolbox. I can move a window and a red toolbox. This is the first time you're going to use that, is it? Actually, you need to come here and fix this for me. It's um, in this view, and I can't get the table of contents, so I can right click on it. So it down, like, over, 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 over. Sign it to everything. Where's this KML? Table of contents, of course. Catalog. Catalog. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, where's the KML? Where's the KML? It's in data. She has the everything. <laughs> Scroll down, click on the All right. Can I download that in the class folder? Anywhere right now, doesn't matter. Download folder or straight into GS class. Both places go. Okay, so let's get rid of a few things so you can see this in a nice way. The toolbox. Can you see this? Remember I started out the class and telling you, hey, let's open up the door to the garage and I show you different workbench and different tools. Welcome to the tool bench. Yeah? All right. Everyone has downloaded the KML file. Thumbs up. Daniel. Yeah, I downloaded I'm Just look. All right. You now. have our catalog open. Yes. All right. You guys are cool with our catalog and the KML file? All right. So what we're going to do is now we're going to look at the conversion tools. So Arc Toolbox, 
conversion pops up tons of stuff. Yeah? The important part to remember here right now is that there is a ton of stuff for import and export. So you're not alone in the universe. Yeah? You can talk to other systems. So what we're going to do now is we're taking a look at the from KML. And there's a function called KML to layer. And you can see that there's a, it's a tool because it has this hammer. All right? <coughs> if I double click this guy, it might be faster or slower among some machines, I get this toolbox or the, the function KML to layer. I do recommend to click show help here at the bottom. If you never had a, a tool before open, if you're just interested, instead of watching a soap opera, play around with the toolbox. You'll find options like, wow, yeah? hide or show the help. It shows you in one or two sentences what this animal called tool is doing. Tells you, converts a KML or KMC, yeah? into feature classes and a layer file. Yeah? The layer file maintains the symbology found within the original KML, KMC. Let's, let's sync that in. Before we do this tool, it transforms this into a feature class and a layer file. A feature class and a layer file. This is called the layer file. Yeah? Because it maintains a symbology. Okay? So don't be confused that you get more out of the box than just one. So we're doing input. That's our KML. So if you save it in the GS class folder, it will be in the GS class folder. In theory, it should be actually in the downloads, because we didn't do save as, we just downloaded it. Yeah? So I found here my German food in downloads. Yeah? Might look a little bit different because I have Google Earth installed, that I can. Yeah? I hit open. So now it wants to know the output location. And the output location is where you're going to mess up if you're not really particular and careful. Because you've just clicked on this right now, it will save it to anywhere your system is thinking it should be. We want to control this guy, so we are going to save this in GS class. Oh, we can actually save it in demo three. Session 3. In Session 3, Winter 2017. And the reason why we can save it there is because we are doing the, using the data from that session. So it's all compact. Hey, Dr. Wurzer, yep. um, in Toolbox, where can I find that KML to layer? In Toolbox, where can I Yeah. Where, though? Uh, conversion, conversion Tools. tools. Uh, conversion Tools, KML to layer, mm -hmm. looking up the KML file, yep. Yep. which yeah. is in this case Dropbox, German Food, so now, output location, I click once. Don't double click on it. Because it's asking for basic types. It only wants the folder name here. No? So I do that and say add. See how it changed? So it will save as output location, GIS class session 3, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? And output name, we keep it with the food. Moment of truth, let's click OK. If everything works, different machine might not work. All right, let's wait a little bit. Let's wait a little bit. The help tells you actually that it can take a while. Yeah? If you are lucky and have notifications, you can see the small green check. Tool has successfully rendered. What? Yeah? I got a. Who got a X, red X? That's the smallest screen ever. Uh, so, all right, let's, let's go take a look at the catalog window. 
Can you tell me what this thing is here? Uh, give me one sec. I want you guys to go to session 3, winter 17, and refresh. And tell me what has changed. Set. 
if you go down here, it says points. Huh? And that's something we know. That's something we have seen before. That looks like uh, one of the uh, data elements we had before. It says points. Looks like points. But if you really careful, look at your screen. It's slightly blue. Now, oh, gray. Slightly blue or gray. The points we have here from last week, the demo cars, are greenish. So, hmm? is uh, the color uh, randomized? No, it's a K and now. One is a shape file, and the other feature class is inside the database. So, a tiny touch of color uh, as a change. So, if I double click on the points, this is something we have seen before. A, lot, a bunch of lots of tabs. It shows here that there's a data set, that's um, projection in there. We can see fields. Yeah? Or the most common way to explore this is we look at the table. Is this automatically set to 1984 because that's what we did last time? No, this is a map projection coming from Google. And they use the WGS 1984? Mm -hmm. I'm under the XY coordinate system. See how it's already yep. has that in there. Well, it's the World Geographic System. So that's what they yeah. use. So it's, it's, but they are different, they're using a different uh, uh, coordinate ID. Yeah. But in theory, it's something we use as a, for a family exchange. So you can be okay with this. If I look here at the table, you can see it has a point Z in it. X, Y, Z, not just a point. So it actually has 3D data in it. <coughs> just in case we have a high mountain restaurant. Yeah. And you also have here the names and some other information downloaded from Google. So it actually kept the names for us. Yeah. OK? It's like wrecking frack. Let's have a moment of Three minutes. Can you help me with this resolution? Yes. Have you ever tried the Cypress Nook? That was pretty good. Um, really small. You're doing a break now. So we'll check this out. Uh, like what? This. You're doing this. I'm not doing off topic stuff. It's, doing not this. Topic. it's the world with, with demographic and all this data, right? That's what we're so, so, cool. But like, that's they exactly. shape the country Whoa. based on the scaling. We can do this. Oh, guys, I need this three minute break. So, bathroom, stretch your legs, open the doors for fresh air. Please. Take some right now. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to, it should be in another display. And what you can do is here is change the setup for your screen. I don't know if you should save that as a actually Save that as a different setup. So, what I would recommend is to go into a different format. What am I right now? 32 and 18. Huge. Go through it. Just play with this. If you hit the button, mm -hmm. huh? it changes the screen. You don't want that one. So, it might be an okay thing to say it performance. Let's do.
size of tags, you can do a lot of this. I'm going to do what we call it, the system default view. It fucks you up. So, if we look at the um, German food now again to recap, we found data from the web, someone shared it with us. We imported it in our GIS because we said we want to deal with this in some way. We want to be able to edit the data. Yeah? So now I have germanfood.layer as a symbology. If I click on this, it's the same setup we had in the um, in Google Maps. Yeah? We might be able to manipulate that later too. But the important part is you actually created a GEO database called germanfood.gab uh, and it placed underneath the um, uh, feature class folders or data set. If you look here, this is actually data set. It created points for us. We'll come back to those guys later. Yeah? So the next thing is I want to go back and take a look at the XY events. You know, all about, about right now, if I share data with you, how to get it into your GIS. Yeah? So, from last session, we have done here the BIS University Drive raw CSV. CSV. It's just short for businesses on University Drive raw table, so no manipulations, and it's CSV format even before it shows up as CSV. Huh? We also had this guy called the same name, by the ends on a different uh, extension, ends on DBF, database format or database file. Huh? So they look similar. Huh? They should be the same, 318. 318 here at the bottom, yeah? because they are pretty much the same because I stole them from this guy. Remember, if you're in File Explorer and you have four or five, five different extensions, one extension is the DBF. So what I basically did is I copied and pasted it and renamed it. I stole the data table. Yeah? But what I want to do is now, this is just for backup, the sheet. I want to explore my options. How would I get a list 
of a bunch of companies here, company name, with some street, some city, and state, and state name, and zip codes, and here I have the North American um, North American industry code system, the NICE code, and the sales volume, or EMP num is my employment numbers. Yeah? How do I get that into my GIS? Well, we could right click on it. Remember, most secret functions are cool and hidden with a right click. So if I right click on it, nothing shows. That's cool, is it? Nah. Let's open up ArcMap. Yeah, so in my ArcMap, what I can do is I can try to drag and drop a CVS, a CSV, sorry, CSV, into um, my ArcMap. And it changes here from the layers to the location of the data, uh, list by source. Because the CSV file does not know where it's located right now. Alright, I repeat that step. Yeah? In my blank arc, arc map, what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to drag and drop with a left mouse click, drag and drop my CSV table. And you'll realize I can hear looks like a text file, changes now to a table. So my ArcMap recognizes this as somewhat a table format. Let's take a look at this. If I double click the sky, I even now have fields coming up. Or I can right click on it and say open. And it looks like a table. Huh? Even though it's a text file, that's somewhat of the transformation on what we see on the flights. Very nice of it. No? Everyone has that. Everyone has the CSV file in ArcMap? I, I do, but I right click and open it. Ah, uh, you're pulling the soft one. Remember, you have to on the machine here. Round up the dots. Yeah, right. Okay. So let's just remove this guy. Go and do a simple thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Open the file. Alright. So. somewhere? Yes, we do. We have, remember, we have that file called imagery with labels. Let's just open that one up. So instead of going out in the World Wide Web, finding the downloading one, I just open that file. Yeah? And it pops up like this. And how do I get this space map into my current project? Drag and drop. Drag and drop. Did you explode? Um, it didn't explode, but my when I open up the layer, the table is above it, and I can't drag it down. Uh, we're just dragging something like this. I can only see the bottom of the window. Actually, it's on top. Alright. Uh, this is probably the whole world image. So it's open. Or it's up here. Alright, 
So, why did I look? Why did I look? Let's try this here. All right. So if I go here to table, drawing by drawing order, I see the base map. I dragged and dropped it from the other project. Um, and you should, if you do a reload, right here on the bottom, refresh, it should show the whole world. Because it has no other reference right now than show me the world. OK? Should we close out the other one? Yeah, we can do that. So it doesn't crash. <laughs> All right. All right. Speaking of crashing, let's save this this guy today, and I call it demo four in our GIS class folder. Yeah. Are you guys okay? She wasn't here, so she didn't have the imagery, so she's putting that. Ah, okay. Are you combining the uh, base map now with the uh, label? Yeah, we close the image with labels to close that. And the same here as demo four. Okay, yeah, so demo four is that the uh, with the uh, Biz University CSV? Yep. Uh, All right. So if I look here, you guys are now cool. Got this? When she saved the imagery, the icon wasn't. It doesn't have the little like magnifying glass. Ah, it's not an MXD file. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, on the So this is part of the setup. Let's examine this. This is very confusing. This is a very simple step, but can be very confusing if you're not aware of it. So always remember what are uh, almost cursed here. What are we looking at? Huh? <laughs> almost. If you haven't done that yet, I want you to go over each of those icons and wait until the pop-up comes and it will tell you what are you looking at. Yeah? And then I want to have you play between sort a uh, list by um, order and list by source. I want you need to take a look at why is this different. If you do a list by order, like all these layers, how we overlap them, your CSV file is not showing because it's not a layer yet, it's just a table. Now we gotta get that guy into the walking stages. Yeah? So click over here, hover over that, and explore those functions. Okay, got it. So if you click here on this by source, you should maybe see something like this, or a base map. But very distinct is you can see where that table is saved. Okay? So now, if you're on the list by source, we're going to right click on it. Right click on this uh, on the BIS University Drive raw CSV. Uh, the only data table we have. If you right click on this guy, all the magic functions are up. The 
magic functions of today are display XY data and geocode addresses. Hold your horses with the geocode. Now, gotta have a PowerPoint slide first. What, this, what, this, what does this mean? I want you to click display XY data. seen that screenshot. Mm -hmm. huh? This is where we have to map the fields for the function to the fields in the table. What are our fields we need? What is the x and the y fields here? It's easy. It told us. It's called actually point x here. Huh? Sometimes you need to know if you deal with lat long. It's not lat long when it comes to x, y. Read my lips. It's not lat long when it comes to x, y. It's long lat. Longitude and latitude. But it's just easier to say that long than long lat. You say let long five times versus five times the other way around, it's going to confuse Long let for x, y in this tool. Yeah? What? <laughs> okay. So, it's also in the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> Mine still smells good. This <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta do those exercises. The minimum is read like a comic book. That's the reason why I love this textbook. If you don't spend the two or three hours in doing the exercise, at least go through it and recognize the tool and read what the tool does. Yeah? So you uh, map the x field to point x, y field to point y. I keep the z open. Don't need that. And I click OK. What happened? I got a, got a point. Mine says you don't have an object ID. Oh, the arc arrow? You do have an object ID. I don't know, mine says. Does not have object ID? That's a 162. You have this place. You can press it down. Uh, at the bottom, uh, before clicking on OK, you have a checkbox where it says, warn me if the resulting layer will have restricted functionality. Alright, uh, here? Yeah. Some of them have a uh, click on the checkbox. Ah, uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Well, I did not click on the checkbox. Why did you click on the it checkbox? Was it was his fault. Alright, don't warn me. Just hit this. X, 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 Y, Y. And OK. I get a point. Alright, let's take a look at it. Remember what I said? Data screening, cleanup, validation. So I have points here. That's a point. That's weird. This is not a business on University Drive, is it? Do I have other points here? No. To make sure that I'm not really going nuts, I'm going to click off and say here, zoom to layer. Now that looks like University Drive, a bunch of businesses next to each other. About like, this is a street, is it? Where'd you zoom to layer there? Under yeah, for, <laughs> for this one, zoom to layer. Under business universe. Yeah. So well, let's take a look at here on image screen. Let's load this up. Oh, oh, wait, look. My scale is 1 to 1.18. Like, I'm looking at a fingernail right now in the world. If I go out, one to one thousand or something. What is the point? I'm still somewhere south of Africa. What is here? What happened? Do <coughs> meters instead of degrees? Explain it to your classmates. 
Why do you know that we're doing meters right now instead of decimal degrees? Well, I'm writing those meters. All right. How does this impact us? What's that? How and why does this impact us? Those latitude, longitude are measured in degrees, right? Yeah, that's why. Smart ass. Good. I was wondering why you said uh, this is going to be a screw up. I saw you were looking at the bottom right corner. All right. Let's find the other one. So how do we switch it? Well, the way to switch it is different ways. You can A, do it with a different base map, or anyone else who wants to have the smart S on or off today, and I mean, I mean that a bit more. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I understand. Any idea? Double right click. Let's kill this guy first. We remove, go back, right click on it and go back to display XY data. We map the fields. Dum -dum. X and Y. What else can we do in this setup? Let's explore the edit tool. Favorites, if you saved that from last time, or if we don't have the favorite fav saved, what we could do is you do the search for WGS as an example. 1984. Kristen, 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 Kristen. I always mess up your name. Kristen, Kristen. This is important. Look at this. That's a search function. Yeah? So I can search now for everything that is the World Geographic System. And mine doesn't pop up. Okay. WGS probably has a space. Yep. And I'm going to the geographic coordinate system world and select the one I would like to use. Yeah? This is the one we use for digitizing. It has the degree units here, so let's see if this works. Yeah? If it doesn't, we need to start with the right base map. And click OK again. Ha! Ah, look at that. Points are in Florida. So I have two of the uh, CSV events. Do I delete one of them? Or? Yeah, one is the equator and one is the, the right one. Well, the reason why I deleted mine first is so I don't mess up with the I'll two of them. Remove one and see what happens. <coughs> well, you soon to it. Go back to the layer. Okay. Do you see this on the screen actually? The right way? Hey, Noah. Can you repeat that? All right. As Dustin pointed out, we did not get the right units and the right coordinate system in place. Goes one more step and I repeat that too. Okay, I delete all the stuff I've done so far. So if I look into my table here, open it, and I look here at point X and point Y, I will see that this is a common format in longitude and latitude. Yeah? All that long. So I already see here this is supposedly in that small degrees. <coughs> so if I run this against meters, yeah, you're minus 80 meters west meter meets. Yeah? So when the equator and the meridian hits zero zero, you're just about that. One stone throw away in the middle of the ocean. Yeah? So validation of your data, data screening. We did not look at this table at all for these fields. So that's in here, double thumbs up. So now, right click on it, display XY data. I do the proper field mapping, X and Y. Right now, I'm lucky that the X and the Y are actually labeled, see? 
to go out. It's actually the wrong thing. Point. I'm lucky that this is like by field name matched up. It could be anything. So you need to know what's in there as a value. And then I will choose the coordinate system for the input coordinates here. Yeah. Edit. Now it should be in my favorites. WGS 1984. Yeah. And click OK. This is the super simple setup. Bare basics. There are different flavors of that geographic system, but this is the bare basics. Huh? It's a car. I don't care what type of metal make or model. It will drive. Huh? And yes, there could be warnings. Let's just say we are fine. And hit this. So it creates the layer here is called event. Huh? And it does look okay. It's not geocoding. This is important to understand. It is not geocoding. I'm using a given x, y, and I put it, uh, display it on my map. This is like I give you a coordinate system in, in mathematics, like this, and say you have a point that is 2, 2, and a point, I don't know, 6, 4. I give you a list, 6, 4, and 2, 2. Yeah? This is that whole thing. You display data. Even though it looks like we have had before, things we had before, it's a dot on a map. It's just display. So next important step is we're going to save it. Save slash export. To save and export this, I right click on it again. So now you can see I get different functions. Those are now functions we know and have seen before from shapefiles. Huh? I'm going down here to data and say export data and click on it. Now I can export all the data, yeah? or just the ones you're looking at it. Right now we want all of them. The tricky part now is layer source data for the projection or the other one. We stick to the source because we know, go Dustin, that we're actually now pulling in a different data source. The WGS 1940. Huh? 84. 84, eh? This is a typical German thing. You should know that you're speaking Swedish. It's Swedish in the numbers. Swap the numbers as well. Sorry, uh, swap the numbers. In terms of tens and single singles. You can talk about that in the break. Yeah. So the WGS 1940. want to save this. You can see it pumps it somewhere I had last time that tool. So what I do is again I find my folders. And again, I do this very gently and slowly. Output feature class. Browse. And go here with my folder connections. Find my GIS class. Oopsie. Wrong click. GIS class. Winter 2017, session 3. And now I rename it and I make sure that I'm actually in front of that period. Can we double click on the session 3? Yep. Right now, because you want to use it as a folder, but uh, and not as a location. And we call this guy this underscore university drive. Yeah? And I click OK or save. Mine doesn't save. Mine wants to save as a file on personal to database. Just change it. Uh, if you have this, you're not saving it as a proper <coughs> file. What we want to do right now is we want to save it as a shape file. And we will come to the file and personal to database feature class later. Okay. Remember, we're doing this guy right now, SHP. We're going to do that later. Yeah? Uh, 
save it as a shape file. This is important. That little thing here, save as type, throws off students usually in working at home. Not saying assignment, but exploring chairs. Got to make sure that you are in the right, right type. If I would go here for the file type, for the feature, cheer database, it will change the view. Do you see that? Shape file. Oh my gods, the things I have seen before. If I go now to cheer database, it only pops up the German food cheer database we created earlier. It doesn't recognize the shape file. It doesn't recognize that the family reunion has the other cousins in the corner of the room. No? So you gotta be precise what you're saving. If it says, let's say, export the data into a test.shp, you know that you're saving it as a shapefile. No? And if I use that function in the assignment, I will make it clear that you have to save it as a shapefile. So type shapefile. This underscore university drive.shp. You should see those guys, and click save. Of all features, layers, source data, coordinate system, and the location. Click OK. And yes, we want to map or add the data as a layer. So now you have, let's switch. Can we delete the old? Wait. Table we did at the CSV file. You can see now here, affiliated with it is the event. Yeah? Because it's the display. It's this guy here. And now we save this as a separate file, as now as a shape file. And what we did, remember, if I have a point shape file. I have two, el two important elements in that. Uh, let's make sure that you guys see this on the video screen. If I have a shapefile, if I have now my point shapefile, yeah, I will have Geometry or shape. Yeah, that is, in this case, point. I also have the associated table with it with at least an ID number to it. I created this one now. So, table X, Y. Display and that is my SHP. Does this make sense? I download a CSV file, a table. I display it into a map in the right proper coordinate system. And now with export slash save, I created a physical new shape file. Makes sense, but it's something really too hard to digest. I mean, well, basically, I gave you a telephone <coughs> book and you give me a spatial file back. I mean, the view yeah. consists of the, uh, the yeah. text with the number values for the coordinates. And then we uh, make sure to display as XY coordinates on the map. And then with that, we save it as a shape file because there are points on the map. Okay, let's write this down here. So this is display data, and then this, this here is save. Yeah? One is display, and one is really making the physical change. Yeah? All right? This is a cool and fun tool. Back in the days, the EPA would list toxic release information. So anywhere where a chemical spill is, train tracks, companies, they will produce a TRI, yeah? 
fly. <coughs> Toxic release information. And they would save that as an XY. Uh, they would save that as lead long in a CSV file to double. And the really cool part would be take the CSV file, put it on a map, in five minutes you have nationwide all the spills for last year for a certain period of time. Well, without no, doesn't matter where and what, just the lead long coordinate gave you where to put it on the map. How can you click on these dots and pull up the info? Well, how do we click those dots and pull up the info? Well, you first of all zoom in, and for the ease of visualization, I change those dots in big green circles. It's easier to see for you guys. Yeah? I can simply click the identifier tool and maybe select one here. Maybe it could be five. And now I'm looking at the Information, everything that was stored in my table is now affiliated with that dot. Yeah. If I, also, there's something you guys need to recognize. It does not have a name. Some might not have a name. That's part of, part of looking at the table here. So if you look, well, if you go here for company name and say sort, some might be empty. Some might not. They no, might have names. They should be all have names. Well, but I'm clicking on the info that. But all right, are you what? What are you looking at? Here, are different options you can select from. So, you, if you select your topmost layer, my topmost layer is the, the university drive. Yeah, or visible layers, or go straight into the layer you want, the business university drive. We'll, we'll put that up. So this there's a pull up uh, anywhere in the middle. Yeah, this is your uh, now it's yeah. I guess. Are you on top of the yeah. How did you get to that section yeah. identified? I right clicked on it. Over it. Right, here's the inspector tool. <coughs> uh, and also, if you use the identifier tool, you need to be aware of where is the layer of interest in your table of content, guys. Look here. Where is it located? Because if I do this, just zoom, select one here for fun or multiples. So now I have four different businesses located, but I need to make sure which one in that list I'm selecting. Here, business university drive. Yeah? And you can look at that. But you also, if you know the area, you will realize, let's zoom in here to all things. They're all over the place and most of them are along the street. Yeah? Because they have different accuracy. Because no one so far wondered why we have the locator name here that says point address and street address. If it says point address, it's on the top of the building. If it says street address, it's somewhere along the street block. The lead long helps a little bit, you know? But you can see all these business, all the Costco, Best, Best, Buy, Best Buy, Home Depot, all these in the whole shopping center are not on top of the building because they are somewhere here along that road. Something important to recognize. If I want to do a study and realize in a scale to one to five thousand what is east and what is west of University Drive, this is a piece of garbage as a high end technical term. Yeah? Because I do not know exactly, or I can find the Costco data point, Costco is here, but it would make sense to have it on top of the building. If I want to compare businesses along University Drive, along Nova University and uh, 595, and look at that stretch here and compare it to why not, Knob Hill, let's say Knob Hill, you know, then it makes sense. Accuracy is good enough. You know? Because it doesn't matter if it's on top of the building or just in front of the street. If I do this whole data thing for the state of Florida, 
zip code would be good enough. Huh? So the accuracy comes into play. 